Nikita Nikrasov, who will tell us two stories about very interesting things. Okay, thank you very much. So it's a, indeed, it's a conclusion of uh, extremely uh, interesting and very intensive, uh, intense conference. I'm very grateful to the organizers for making this possible and for giving me the opportunity to talk. Uh, so because it, it was a very difficult week, uh, so I'll, I'm going to entertain you with two short stories uh, in two dimensions. So for us, uh, strings math, math is an experimental part, or part of, of string theory, and, but I, I will try, if, try to maybe open the window into other branches of theoretical physics which we could use to test our ideas at least. So the first part is Young Mills theory on origami world sheets. Um, let me remind you something which is very simple. It's a two-dimensional gauge theory uh, on conventional world sheet, which let's say we can take to be a cylinder. So if you view 2D Young Mills canonically, uh, take the space uh, manifold to be just a circle, then the phase space is the uh, space of electric fields and, and gauge fields on the circle, and you take a simplex equation with respect to the action of the gauge group, which is a group of maps of the circle to the group. And the result is the cotangent bundle to the uh, maximal torus uh, uh, of, the, of the group divided by the white group. And the Hamiltonian, which is uh, the quadratic Casimir evaluated on the electric, electric field, becomes just Laplacian acting on uh, uh, on W invariant functions on the maximal torus, also known as class functions. Now, uh, so the, in practice, so how we do that, with the, so there is a moment map, also known as Gauss law, which says that the electric field, which is a function valued in the Lie algebra on the circle, is covariantly constant. And so its invariants are just constants on the circle. And the, the part, which is the, uh, the maximal torus divided by the value group, it parameterizes the conjugacy classes of the holonomy of the gauge field around the circle. And so these are the only degrees of freedom of, of our theory. Now let's generalize this story. So instead of a circle, let's take a general, general graph. Uh, well, I will take it to be a trivalent graph. Uh, with, so I will uh, distinguish internal vertices, which I want to be uh, trivalent, and the tails, which, which are one valent. And so if you uh, parameterize this graph by the number of tails and the, and the, uh, uh, the number of loops, the only characteristics uh, being one minus g, I assume it's connected. Then you have three g minus three plus n internal edges and two g minus two plus n internal vertices. And so as part of my data, I want to fix a coagent orbit of the group uh, per tail. So if I have n tails, I have n quadrant orbits, and I'll denote this and by O of nu i. So nu i stands for the uh, collection of invariants of the orbit. Now, uh, so we can define the phase space to be the space of piecewise smooth gauge fields and electric fields which uh, don't have to uh, be continuous, so they're allowed to jump at the vertices. But the gauge group, to, uh, I'll take to be a group of continuous maps from, from the graph to, 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 to the fine dimensional group. And so if you perform the symplectic reduction of that phase space by, the, by this uh, uh, gauge group, you have a you'll get a fine dimensional phase space whose dimensionality is twice the dimension of the group times g minus one plus the sum of dimensions of the quadrant orbits which you fixed. So in this reduction, the moment map consists now of two parts. It has uh, the part which is the covariant derivative of the electric field on the internal, on the intervals, internal parts of the edges. And then for each internal vertex, uh, you take, it's a sum of the limiting values of electric fields from, from all sides. And so when we perform the reduction, we impose the Gauss law, we set all these quantities to zero. Uh, now, if, if this, uh, if, if, if some of the edges at the vertex happen to be the tail, then uh, the electric field coming from the tail is uh, required to be belong to the conjugacy class specified by the tail. Uh, otherwise, it's the same condition. So the claim is that this phase space is a quantum integrable system, and so that's the part which is, uh, I mean, it's 
slightly non-trivial to see it from, from the get-go, but if you think of this system as kind of a, uh, the generation of Hitchin system, it, it, it would be obvious. Uh, so I, I'm going to present that many, that many Poisson commuting Hamiltonians constructed out of the electric field. So uh, for each internal edge, we can, we can take the values of the invariant polynomials on the Lie algebra evaluated on the electric field, and because of the Gauss law, which says that the electric field is currently constant, they will be constants throughout the edge. So it's, you just get the number per edge, and the total number of those things are R, the rank of the group. Now, for each vertex, we have to work a little bit harder to produce additional that many functions where, so D sub K is the degree of the homogeneous uh, invariant polynomial. For SUN, those degrees are two, three, four, up to N. Uh, for other groups, they are other numbers, interesting numbers. So what you do, you take two out of three electric fields which meet at the, at the vertex, and you form the linear combination, like a twister combination, E1 plus lambda E2, you substitute them into these uh, homogeneous uh, invariant polynomials, and then you expand in lambda. Now, as a f so this is a function, this is a polynomial function of lambda, of which you know three values. You know its value at lambda equals to zero, because that's the pk evaluated at the e1 at this edge, and that's already counted accounted for. You know its value at lambda equals to one, because that's the same thing as minus e3. And that's the conjugacy class here, which you fix by other Hamiltonians. And then when lambda goes to infinity, the leading term will be pk evaluated at e2. And so that's the third edge. So out of dk plus one coefficients, which this polynomial contains, you subtract three uh, for this reason. And that's what you, you get uh, from each vertex. And so when you sum up these numbers together, you get precisely the half of the dimension of the phase space. Now, this is not the actual uh, story which I want to present. What I want to present, uh, the new part, so this is very old. This is like 30 years ago. The, the new part is the, uh, the geometric interpretation of what this uh, phase space is parameterized. Uh, and I will be, do it for the group SU2. So let's start with a simple, sca simple case, g equals to 0, which is uh, the case where my graph is actually a tree. The claim is that what this, the points on this phase, phase parameterize are polymers in, in the three-dimensional Euclidean space modular isometry. So what do I mean by a polymer? Well, it's a, it's a closed uh, n-gon whose uh, edges are, uh, uh, have lengths which are fixed by my uh, uh, coadjoint orbits data. So remember, I had to fix per, uh, a coadjoint orbit uh, which for SU2 is just a two-dimensional sphere per, uh, per tail, and the data of the quadrant orbit is just the radius of the sphere. So these, these are the numbers now, nu1, nu2, nu3, and so on. So the uh, electric fields which you get at the uh, edges uh, become just vectors in R3, and the totality of the Gauss law conditions just says that they sum up to zero. So you have a collection of n vectors, in three-dimensional space, the sum is equal to zero, and the, uh, the lengths are fixed. So you can organize them in this closed uh, chain. And so that's what this space parameterizes, uh, up to overall rotations and translations, of course. So uh, uh, now the graph, the, so, this, so this, is example, this is an example of a tree. So the graph actually gives slightly more data than just the polymer itself. It also tells, gives a, uh, uh, so there is additional discrete information, which is a partitioning of this polygon into tr triangles by diagonals. So uh, different graphs with the same number of tails will give me different partitions of this, uh, of this polygon. And the equivalence between this, uh, these things will be a part of what I'm, I'm going to tell uh, later. But, uh, so the integrals of motion are, are, you know, Hamiltonians built out of electric field, the trace of E squared, essentially they are the squares of the lengths of these diagonals. And so in the time evolution of, uh, of this gauge, of gauge system living on that space, uh, the diagonals are, uh, re remain intact, they're integrals of motion. 
So what changes? The shape of the polymer changes. And how can it change? Uh, it changes by, by changing the dihedral angles between, between the uh, uh, triangles at which, which are shared by the diagonals. So if you turn on different Hamiltonians corresponding to different edges of the space manifold, you start bending the, the, uh, these polygons in all possible ways and, uh, allowed by the specific partition uh, by the diagonals. And so the symplectic form, the, uh, the, this, which we descended from by the reduction, is just uh, so d, alpha, d length of the diagonal, which d of the dihedral angle at each diagonal. So these are the flows, which are called bending flows because they precisely bend the, the shape. They were uh, studied in a slightly more general case uh, by this gentleman. And uh, of course, in the context of Tachmiller theory, they're also known as uh, Fernhill-Nielsen flows. So they uh, correspond to, uh, I forgot what they're called. Anyway, so there are, of course, a gauge theory. Uh, the two-dimensional gauge theory is more than just the uh, time evolution on, on a fixed space manifold. It also, uh, so a pair of pants in the simple case allows, us for, allows for the merging or the splitting of, of space manifolds. And so it would be nice to generalize this story for general graphs because we can then um, fuse and, and split graphs. And that will give us the uh, origami world sheets. So the... Uh, if you slightly deform this story, so re deform the 2D young Niels into essentially three-dimensional Chen Simons theory, uh, then uh, this uh, interpretation of polymers in Euclidean in, in three-dimensional space remains valid, except that now the ambient space will be curved. It will be either three-dimensional sphere or three-dimensional Lobachevsky space. And uh, so this parameterization of polygons by uh, diagonals and the dihedral angles was very useful in the beta gauge correspondence. So now recently, so since I want to bring new physics into the game, uh, these polymers suddenly re reappeared in the study of uh, Sasha Migdal's loops equa loop equations, uh, which he's uh, you know, proposing for describing decaying, decaying universe, uh, decay, decaying not universe, turbulence, sorry. Decaying turbulence. Uh, I mean, the universe could also be decaying, but it's, uh, it's not his style. Uh, so he's uh, writing equations for the uh, uh, averages of the circulations around the loop in the, in the flu fluid dynamics. And uh, somehow, by some kind of Fourier transforming loop space, he arrives at this polygonal loops, which uh, uh, follow certain stochastic process. And because of this uh, symplectic structure, you have a natural measure on the space of these polygons, which polymers, sorry, which uh, uh, might be useful in, in understanding turbulence. Now, what about the case of the higher genus? So already the case when G was equal to one, and you have any, any number of uh, tails, it's interesting because that just describes, this, describes conventional young Mills theory with heavy charges. So these tails now are the positions where the heavy quarks are sitting, and so they become time-like Wilson lines. So if, in, in, if you take the simplest case of a single uh, uh, n equals one, you can compute the, the Hamiltonian in, uh, some, in some gauge where the, the holonomy of the uh, gauge field around the circle, let's say, is diagonal. And then the electric field has, uh, has this form you can compute. And the Hamiltonian would describe a motion of a particle uh, on a circle. So that's, that's the maximal torus of my gauge group. But now this particle is subject to a potential. And by the way, that type of Hamiltonian, so locally this is the type of Hamiltonians which you get in, in analytic Langlands, uh, except that in the work of uh, Kajdan, Eitingoff, uh, and Frankel, this, co this constant nu has a very special value. And if you make it more general, then the issues of convergence, which uh, I was pestering David, David about, is, it becomes much more uh, you know, complicated. But the question is, what is the geometric meaning of, uh, of the phase space corresponding to these higher genus graphs? So we can look at the graph close, uh, closely at the vertex, at the trivalent vertex. So we see that, again, so it has a trivalent vertex. So, it, so it, it's natural to associate to it a triangle in the three-dimensional space. Now it will be a, a, an isosceles triangle, right? So it has two sides which are equal. 
and uh, the, the, the one side which I draw, drew in green is, uh, is, is a boundary. Now the question is, where is the room for beta for the dual variable, which, is, uh, uh, which we have because it's a two-dimensional phase space? And what's the role of, 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 the, uh, of phi of the holonomy of the gauge field? Sorry, uh, I'm not pressing the right button. Uh, so the idea is to go to the universal cover of, of my graph and associate an, an infinite polymer to that. So if I just keep, you know, make a deck transformation, introduce an, another copy of this vertex, so now I have another triangle, and now I can attach them at the uh, angle, at the hydral angle beta. But it's an infinite process because uh, if I go to the universal cover, then I have an infinite number of copies of, of these things. So we can make it finite, we can make the resulting polymer finite by introducing a conical deficit uh, defect in R3. And so uh, before you introduce this defect, you just keep attaching these triangles, and so they will form this kind of fan structure. Uh, and uh, if you look, so if you introduce a deficit angle which will allow you to actually identify the endpoints of uh, uh, of, of each interval so that this infinite picture actually collapses to just one edge polymer. Uh, so if you look at it from the above, from the, uh, so you just, you see the, 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 there is some deficit angle and that angle is precisely the eigenvalue, is the angle phi which is the eigenvalue of the holonomy, uh, logarithm of the eigenvalue of the holonomy of the gauge field around the circle. So, uh, so you see, so if, introduce, so if you introduce the, co the, de the conical uh, uh, defect in the transfer space, so it corresponds to ins inserting a kind of a cosmic string, then uh, it is possible to have a closed polymer now which consists of a single edge, simply because of the identifications of the sides of the, uh, of the cut. And now if you, so it may be hard to see, to see what's going on, but so I drew using Mathematica some pictures uh, of course, depending on whether the angle phi was rational, uh, uh, phi over two pi was rational or rational, you have a nice fan, or you have something which is will be dense. And so maybe you want to use non-commutative geometry to describe this this, uh, this situation. Uh, now, just as a side remark, and uh, since Valody is here, so. Uh, there is a canonical transformation relating the uh, different parameterizations of the phase space. So P phi was the parameterization in terms of the gauge field and the electric field, and alpha beta are the uh, Darboux coordinates in which the, uh, where alpha is the action variable. And so you can run two kinds of flows uh, in this phase space. So one is uh, generated by the electric field, which is the, the usual flow. And so that's this uh, Sutherland type of Hamiltonian. And another flow which is uh, uh, different, but also possible, is generated by the holonomy of the gauge field around, around the circle. So that, that will be its Hamiltonian. And so that flow will now make uh, alpha and beta variable change. And that's called uh, rational Reisner's Schneider model. So in the connection to chain symmetry, which I mentioned, so once you're, uh, once electric field of 2D annuals becomes the third component of, of the gauge field, these two uh, choices correspond to whether you want to, uh, in Chen Simon's theory, you can use Wilson line around one or, uh, uh, so this would correspond to Chen Simon's theory on the torus with puncture, and you can use the Wilson, line, Wilson loop around the A cycle as your Hamiltonian or Wilson loop around the B cycle as your Hamiltonian. So in, in, in Chen Simon's case, they would be on equal footing. And the limit to, to the young news make them look different. Uh, now, what's going on for the general graph? Well, uh, if we examine the formula for the dimension of the phase space, it's, uh, so it's a dimension of the space of closed uh, and bond polymers in R3, which we had before, plus six times G. So the G is the number of, uh, it's the first beta number of, of the graph. So how do we interpret that? The interpretation is the following, that we, we are studying the polymers, but now uh, this affine Euclidean three-dimensional space where my polymers are, are living uh, is pierced by a collection of G 
straight cosmic strings. So these cosmic strings define, so they're straight lines. But they, they define the conical deficit. So the, the, the value, the amount of the conical uh, angular deficit is one of the parameters. The orientation of the string and actually its position is also, uh, there are also parameters. And there's an additional uh, data, kind of a bead, a uh, point-like object sitting on the string, which, is, uh, which enters the, uh, the triangulation of the polymer. So, uh, so this is the picture which we had before, but now, so what, uh, with a bit more, more explanation. So this is the picture on the covering space. In fact, the whole polymer, in, in this example, consists of a single edge. So this is this new. It's just that because of the uh, identifications of, sp of space uh, due to the presence of the cosmic, sp cosmic string, uh, it actually, it's a closed polymer, but it has only one, one chain. And now there is an additional data, which is the triangulation of this polymer. So the, there is this uh, uh, vertex, which is the, the other vertex of a triangle, and it, it is hidden on the cosmic string. But where exactly it sits on the cosmic string is part of the phase space coordinates. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, if I just think about the polymer itself, I, there, are, uh, I, there are many ways of triangulating it. And so these uh, different choices of triangulation correspond to different choices of, of graphs with the same number of, of tails. Uh, so in the simplest case of the, this you know, S versus T channel scattering graphs, uh, we'll have, we're passing from one set of double coordinates to another set of double coordinates. And this is, a, this is a canonical transformation. So there is a function of, the, uh, of six lengths of the uh, uh, external, external uh, uh, legs and the, 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 the two diagonals on which you partition the, this, the, the um, uh, quadrangle. So this is a quadrangle formed by alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4. And I'm discussing how to change the is parameterization from using uh, the, the diagonal alpha to, diag to cross diagonal alpha tilde. So there is a function of the six lengths, so it's a function of the geometry of the tetrahedron, such that its derivative with respect to the length of, uh, of each uh, of these edges, and by symmetry it's true for any edge, gives you the dihedral angle at this, at this edge. So what is this function? Of course, uh, with the experience with conformal blocks and crossing, uh, you would think it's a volume, but volume is measured in cubical meters, and uh, the length is me measured in meters. So if you differentiate the volume with respect to the length, you'll get something of dimensionality of the area. And we want the angle. Angle is dimensionless. So it should be a function of dimensionality one. Incidentally, if you ask the same question in hyperbolic space, the answer would be a volume. But there you have the measure of length given by the curvature, radius of curvature. So if you take the hyperbolic volume uh, and expand it in the inverse, radius, radio, inverse uh, curvature radius, you need to, to go to the uh, third term in expansion to obtain the function which I'm going to write. The function is actually very simple. It's precisely the sum over all edges, the length of the edge times the dihedral angle. So there is a formula from uh, ancient uh, times, which gives you this angle. Uh, it's not Heron formula, but it's a Shaffley formula, I think, maybe. Uh, and the claim is that uh, if I take this function and differentiate with respect to uh, each of these uh, lengths, uh, size lengths, I will get the, the, the corresponding angle. And so when you look at this function, you can't not to notice that it reminds you the celebrated Dane, Dane invariant, which tells you whether uh, you know, a three-dimensional polytop can be chopped up in pieces and re re rearranged in, in, in some other way to give another polytop. So it's a, it's a second invariant in Euclidean space, uh, apart from the volume, which distinguishes whether two, uh, two, two polytops are uh, congruent. Now, of course, there is a difference because the Dan Dane's invariant takes values in this complicated uh, ring, and this is just a number. Uh, and so this is much more multi-valued than the Dane invariant, but it's okay. Because generating functions of canonical transformations are in general multi-valued. Now, uh, to conclude this part, 
you actually don't need tails at all. So you could have a graph which is, uh, let's say, genus 2 graph, has no tails. Uh, and so if you try to uh, draw a poly, uh, kind of a, so it will be a polymer without any chains, but it consists entirely of the in internal triangulations. And so you just start with a triangle with sides alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and then start attaching to it uh, equal triangles uh, bent at different angles. And so that way you will kind of tessellate a very interesting uh, kind of a, uh, carpet, which will uh, uh, nevertheless, if you, you know, embed this in a space which, which has uh, co cosmic strings. So you start with two cosmic strings at some, uh, uh, with some deficit angles. And now uh, what happens, of course, if you understand the fundamental group of this graph, which is the free group with two generators, is that when you look at the one cosmic string through another cosmic string, you will see the third one. And, and it will start generating an infinite number of cosmic strings because, uh, you can, uh, because, this, because the monodromies, uh, the associate monodromies of the SU2 gauge field on, on this graph do not commute. And so it's an interesting uh, space in which to live. But, and so, so polymers without any edges can live there with the interesting uh, dynamics. So there are interesting developments uh, which I, I'm not going to present, uh, which is to characterize the class of two-dimensional wall sheets on which this is uh, a meaningful theory. Uh, so one can call them origami or foamy wall sheets. So they will contain, they, they are not smooth two-dimensional manifolds, but they are piecewise smooth. Uh, and so they, they contain, uh, so locally they, they, they would look like, like stars, the three-pronged stars times R. And uh, there are conditions on, on uh, how you can compatibly glue them together. So these duality transformations are, can be implemented in this origami world sheet. Uh, so you start your dynamics with something which looks like that across time. And then eventually this, this edge can shrink and then the dual edge can start growing. So again, it's a bit of a challenge to draw this uh, in a way which you can sort of appreciate. So I try to rotate this picture from, uh, well, I apologize. It's, maybe not, so it's, uh, I, I don't know how to make, put movies uh, in the presentation. In mathematics, you can you know, rotate it yourself. It's a, it's a very simple thing. Uh, so gauge theory on this day, on, on, that, on that manifold will realize this canonical transformation, among other things, which I, which I mentioned. And uh, my speculation, so let's speculate where it's late, that uh, these parameterizations of polymers in, in three dimensions using these uh, diagonals and angles might be useful in the study of uh, QCD string for the three-dimensional annuals. Uh, the reason I mentioned Dubovsky at all is that in their proposal, the QCD string contains not just the degrees of freedom corresponding to transverse oscillations, but there is this weird axion field, which is kind of massive field. And maybe it can be generated here by uh, taking into account these loops uh, on graphs. OK, so uh, how am I doing in time? So now on something not completely different, but nevertheless different. So uh, this is a part which is done together with my student, Vasily Yugov, thank you. Uh, Two-dimensional gauge theory and twisted bilayer graphene. So if AI were to write this, this part of the talk, you, you could have blamed it that it can got confused because we were talking about twisted gauge theory so, uh, a lot in this, in this conference. And uh, so, but, but here it, it's graphene which is twisted, not the gauge theory. So what is a twisted graphene? So what is graphene? Graphene is a monolayered sheet of uh, carbon uh, forming a hexagonal lattice. And uh, Game and Novoselov, who were making them by uh, you know, playing with the, with, with the pencils, they also produced uh, uh, not only monolayers, mono but also bilayered, uh, tri triple layered, and uh, several layered, uh, several sheets. And then, uh, uh, people were studying what happens with these uh, structures when you rotate one versus another. So it's uh, so of course they form the so-called moiré patterns. Uh, this is not specific to graphene. These moiré patterns we see everywhere. Uh, but uh, 
it was reported that uh, the bilayer, twisted bilayer graphene has interesting properties at certain angles of this uh, relative rotation. Uh, in particular, superconductivity was mentioned. And so people study the system. I don't know if you can see from the slide, but you, you, you see there is a kind of a emergent periodicity. So this is the, uh, so there is some small atomic scale, inter interatomic scale, and then there is a kind of macroscopic scale, which is much larger, uh, if the, if the twist angle is small. And so what's reported that if you, this angle is like 1.1 degree, the system is superconducting. So people propose models um, explaining that, uh, notably Bistritzer and McDonald. And uh, so of course, I'm not a condensed matter physicist. I can only admire these people who come up with the models for something which is infinitely complicated as condensed matter systems. Uh, nevertheless, uh, something, by, by listening to these people, eventually I, I, mean, I, I could identify some pattern which I think we could be of some use. And so people came up gradually to a simp simpler and simpler models of uh, at least for the Hamiltonian describing the one particle propagation in this, in this background. And so first people came up with a Dirac operator. And then, uh, uh, well, now five years ago, Tarnopolsky, Krychkov, uh, Vishwanath, uh, argued that there is, actually, there is a limit in which you neglect uh, uh, the so-called AA couplings. So they, if you have two, two graphene sheets, there are two uh, kind of low energy configurations if you uh, make, uh, consider them in parallel. There's AA when you know, carbon of the first sheet sits on top of the carbon of the second sheet, and AB when the carbon of the second sheet is, sits in the middle of the hexagon formed by the carbons of the first sheet. So this is called the AB. And AB is energetically more favorable. So just like if you were trying to pack spheres, you would pack spheres between other spheres. So if you neglect the interlayer AA coupling, it turns, so the, this gentleman argued that you get essentially the chiral Dirac operator, which is coupled to an SU2 gauge field. So it's an SU2, uh, uh, SU2 structure because you have two sheets. So the electron can hop between two sheets. And so the, the, uh, the Hamiltonian describes, uh, uh, has, contains amplitudes for hopping from one sheet to another. And so we land into our favorite problem of a two-dimensional gauge fields, two-dimensional gauge fields of which we only look at the zero one component, just like in David at Stoke, for example. Uh, except that now the question is, uh, so, and it was observed that, uh, observed, I think, numerically, that at magic values of the twist angle, which enters as a parameter, so this, uh, this angle is hidden in, the, uh, in this gauge field, in the component of the connection, the, this Hamiltonian has, uh, has zero modes for any value of the quasi-momentum. So it's called flat band. So there is a... Uh, nothing, nothing. I'll, I'll, you know, use just some specific, specific double periodic potential. You don't vary it. Alpha is what you can vary. So alpha is what you vary in your lab. So, um, so uh, right. So, so you have a zero mode for any value of quasi-momentum. So quasi-momentum is essentially a choice of a line bundle. You want line bundles. So you can twist your, uh, the wave function of electron by something which is quasi-periodic. And it's, it's uh, surprising that you have that. The reason it's surprising, OK, we'll, we'll see it later. And so there are proposals that relate the, the emergence of this flat bands to superconductivity. People say that because of that, electrons can strongly interact, and maybe there's some condensation or something like that. So the question is, what keeps this, uh, what stabilizes these flat bands? Is it a topological phenomenon, or what's, uh, what's going on? So uh, what we will propose is a kind of a geometric picture explaining the, the emergence of these magic angles and uh, also give a numerical algorithm for, for, for computing the corresponding wave function. So of course, we're all familiar with Landau problem on, let's say, on, on, on two-dimensional torus. We know that we ha if you had the U1 connection uh, and the curvature of this connection was non-trivial, the first chain class of the bundle was non-trivial, then uh, the index th theorem tells you that either the Dirac operator or its conjugate will have zero modes. 
And so that will guarantee the existence of zero modes simply by the topology. Uh, but in our story, we have an SU2 gauge field. So the index is identically zero because we're also in the flat torus. Uh, so the, it means that the existence of zero modes and the associated flat bands is non-generic. It's something which can happen in the family, but not if you just throw a dice and, and do things. The question is, okay, if it happens in the family, how many parameters do I need to, to fine tune to, to arrive at this, at this uh, special SU2 gauge field, uh, which, which will have a zero mode? So the hint comes from the following considerations, that if my gauge field A sub Z bar, which, which is what we see in this Dirac operator, is such that we have a zero mode, if I perform a complex gauge transformation, I will also have a zero mode because it's a, prob it's a problem on the, on, the, on, on two-dimensional torus, the fundamental domain of the of this moire uh, lattice. Uh, so it's a question about the gauge uh, GC orbit, the complexified gauge field orbit of my gauge field. Now, in the case of a twisted bilayer graphene, the elliptic curve on which we're actually doing this uh, story is special. It's uh, it has this model parameter is uh, uh, it's a it's a orbifold point on on the model space of uh, genus one curves, so it's a cubic root of minus one. Um, so, but we let's start with the max valid for general tau. Uh, now, let me remind you. Of course, you don't need this reminder because already we had a lecture by David, for example. Uh, if we were do if we were to do conventional three-dimensional St. Simons theory with compact gauge group on sigma cross R, the states of St. Simons theory would be conformal blocks of the level K current algebra. And we can describe them as functionals of the uh, gauge field, of the zero one component of the gauge field, sorry for the typo, obeying that property that if I perform the gauge transformation on, on this function, on the, on the gauge field, this functional transforms with the co-cycle. So it's another way of saying that, yes, that, that was, uh, so that was missing. So it's another way of saying that uh, uh, these are sections of a, of a line bundle and this line bundle over the modular space of, of uh, G bundles has level K. Now, uh, there are gauge fields and gauge fields. So, so we, we can, so the, there are different types of uh, GC orbits of, of of gauge fields, and uh, there is a notion of stability which, which will play a role now. Uh, so there is an uh, algebraic def geometric definition of stability saying that for given k, let's say I fix some k positive, there exists a psi, so there is a conformal block, in other words, there is a psi which solves this equation such that it does not vanish on this specific uh, representative of the gauge field. So that's the stability. Now, in differential geometry, so as you probably have guessed from the questions I was asking today, I don't like algebraic geometric stability, I like differential geometric stability. So in differential geometry, there is an equivalent way of phrasing it. It says that you can find gauge transformation, complex gauge transformation, such that the curvature of the associated unitary connection will be zero. In other words, you can endow the holomorphic bundle, which, def which is defined by A sub Z bar, so, uh, with the Hermitian matrix such that the associate connection is, unitary connection is flat. So that's why usually when we talk about chain simon theory, we talk about unitary flat connections. Uh, now, if you think about control blocks as representing something like partition functions of free fermions, if your uh, gauge field A sub Z bar is such that the Dirac operator has a zero mode, then the associate fermionic path integral will vanish. And so that means that uh, I'm looking for the gauge field for which the, all the conformal blocks actually vanish on this, on this gauge field. And that means that the orbit, the associate orbit uh, is not stable. So for the twisted graphene, we need unstable orbits. That's the point. So uh, how to think about unstable orbits? The way to do it is to think about the young Mills flow. Uh, so take a unitary connection, and now think of it as of a point in some infinite dimensional space. On this space, we have the 
uh, Yangel's functional. And we can now run the gradient flow for, uh, generated by this function. So when you look at what this flow does, well, it changes the gauge field by the Young Mills equation, maybe by some compensating gauge transformation. And so if you look at it closely, you see that it actually uh, does so by performing a complex gauge transformation of, on the gauge field. So uh, during the flow, you stay within the GC orbit. Uh, the value of the Young-Mills action decreases, and that's a good, good, good thing to, to have. So just before we go back to gauge fields, let me just give you a simple analogy. If you replace the space of gauge fields by just vector space, the, sp the group of unitary gauge summations by U1, which acts by phase rotation, the analog of the curvature would be the moment map for, the, uh, for this action, and the analog of the level K conform block will be just a homogeneous degree K polynomial in, in these variables. And so stability in this case simply means that there is a homogeneous polynomial of positive degree which doesn't vanish on Z, which means that Z is just not zero. And uh, differential stability, differential geometric stability means that you can rescale your variables, so act by complexified gauge summations, such that the moment map will vanish. And so with you, you can solve for the flow here explicitly, and you will see that if your point Z is equal to zero, it stays at zero. But if it's non-zero, it will get attracted to a, to, to a sphere, to the uh, uh, 2n minus 1 dimensional sphere. Uh, and then if you quotient by u1, you'll get uh, cpn minus 1, which is the analog of the modular space of stable bundles. So we have two critical, point, two critical points, the one where the, uh, uh, which corresponds to absolute minima of the function f squared which corresponds to a sphere, and then the one when z equals to zero, the unstable point uh, with the high critical value of, of the uh, associated function. So back to Young-Mills theory, the study of critical points and gradient flows there has a rich history, going back to I see a bot. And uh, so the picture which I want you to keep in mind is the following. So there are flows which take mo most of gauge fields by the flow will will be brought down to the space of flat connections. So you just, curvature goes to zero. But there are certain gauge fields which get stuck at a higher critical point. So what are these higher critical points? These are the points where the, uh, so you have a solution of young mills equation, uh, uh, which can, in two dimensions, have a simple form. They say that the scalar, which you get out of the curvature by taking like Hodge star, is covariantly constant. And so if, if the connection is not flat, it means that the scalar is non-zero, which means that the connection is reducible. So your structure group is reduced to the commutant of that phi. And for simplicity, so for gauge group SUN, there are, there are intricate, intricate patterns of this breaking, but let me focus on uh, simplest ones for which this uh, field can be, uh, this phi can be diagonalized with distinct eigenvalues. Uh, then if you recall that phi's are actually curvatures of, uh, uh, they, they, they actually become the curvatures of the abelian connections on which your uh, gauge field splits. So the values should be quantized because, the, uh, because of the uh, flux quantization. And so uh, if you arrive at such a solution of young mills equation, your action, your young mills action will be strictly positive and proportional to sums of squares of the, of the fluxes. So now, every such solution comes with a family of, uh, we can call them marginal deformations, which don't change the value of the Young-Mills section. Namely, you can shift the abelian Young-Mills connection by flat connection. And so these flat connections are parameterized by the Jacobian uh, of the Riemann surface. And so you have n minus one copy of such Jacobians for SUN. For SUN, in general, there are other types of solutions. But for SU2, these are the only ones. Now, you say for elliptic curve, for, for elliptic curve, yeah, yeah. For, for elliptic curve, it will be just, oh. yeah, sorry, sorry. In general, it's, it's not, it's, in general, it's not. Oh. If sigma is elliptic curve, it will be, yeah. Uh, so my, but I drew it a torus because the torus was the Jacobian of the curve. In, in, my, in my picture, in this picture, this is the Jacobian. This is to the power, to the power. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, now we are in business because now we, we've, uh, we've got a billion connections and because the sum of the fluxes is equal to zero, some of the fluxes will have to be positive. And for those for, for which, uh, who's are positive, the associated Dirac operator will have zero modes and those are the flat bands actually. And the fact that you can shift this connection by flat connection that explains that you have the flat band for any value of quasi-momentum. So these flat connections are quasi-momentum. So these are desired flat bands. Uh, so for SU2, for n equals 2, this is the generic situation. For if you were to study multi-layered, multi-twisted graphene, there could be mixed phase, phases, which I think are worth investigating. Uh, and there are interesting connections to the work of Friedman, Morgan, Witten, which actually I don't know if Ed thinks of this that way, but actually they used this, uh, the first critical point to describe the modular space of flat connections. So the, uh, it's an interesting way to interpret the Lohenga theorem, but let me not go there. So, but we have a puzzle. So the puzzle is the co-dimension of the space of critical points. So, let, uh, uh, so you see, uh, so you have this, uh, locus of high critical points, and there is a certain number of, of uh, negative directions, so a certain number of deformations which will take you from, from that locus all the way down to this locus of flat connections. So if you want to fine tune your initial conditions for the flow, ensuring that you arrive, you, you, you arrive here, it means that you need to impose as many conditions as the dimensionality of the space of uh, negative modes. Uh, in the language of RG flows, this would be relevant, relevant deformations. And um, you can compute the number of these ne negative deformations, and uh, you'll find that uh, there are three. So there, it's a, uh, there are four zero modes, and, but there is also U1 gauge symmetry, so there are three effective uh, uh, directions. So it would appear that we need to tune three parameters to, to arrive at a flat band, whereas the evidence shows that we need only one parameter. So what's going on? Uh, so this is a discussion of how one computes this, uh, these di directions. So this is algebraic geometric way, and there is again the differential geometric way, simply to compute the negative eigenvalues, eigen uh, directions of the second quadratic form. Uh, so first of all, we did verify numerically by taking the formula for the gauge field, uh, uh, which was derived from the Hubbard model, uh, that at the magic uh, at the magic values of the angle, by running the flow numerically, we did arrive at the, at the Young-Mills connections. And I mean, the zero order test is to compute the Young-Mills action on, on that specific uh, connection and to see that it's strictly higher than the action for the first critical point. So that's a test number zero. But then you actually run the flow and with the precision which you can get from numerical computations, you do get uh, at this point. Uh, but we have, uh, so we have two marginal directions and three relevant directions. So in principle, it could have been that we need to tune five parameters, but we tune only one. So how is it possible? The answer is that the elliptic curve on which we are working is a special curve. It has a Z3 symmetry, uh, which is descended from the hexagonal symmetry of the, uh, of the, of the graphene sheet. And, uh, it's a good thing that we, we discussed the connection on a trivial bundle. So if you have a symmetry of base and you have a trivial bundle, then it, it leads to a symmetry of the bundle and it acts on the space of connections. And so the ansatz of Ternopolsky, Krishkov, Vishwana uh, is actually Z3 invariant and the flow commutes with Z3 symmetry. And so, it, uh, so if you look at the way the space of relevant deformations decompose under the action of Z3, you see that they, they, they uh, decompose into two conjugate non-trivial representations. So modular gauge U1, it leaves you with, a, I call them mustaches. So these are kind of one, one real dimensional now lines. You have several of them, but they are one dimensional, which emanate from, from, uh, from this high critical point. And so uh, in the space of Z3 invariant flows, it's now th th those things have precisely co dimension one. So that's the, that's the explanation. Uh, okay, so then there is some discussion of how, how, the, you can, 
how there are the three acts. Uh, I will skip that for lack of time. So, so this, at least within the model of, uh, of the gentleman, the emergence of magic, the angles, the fact that it's just one angle is explained by these geometric considerations. So there are possibly interesting uh, directions to investigate. Uh, maybe uh, one can also say something about the more sophisticated graphene sheets because people now make graphenes, uh, uh, they roll them up, they combine them, they twist them, they, uh, they can make origami out of them, and so maybe there is some connection to part one of this talk. So to conclude, I wanted to mention my, uh, well, mentor, uh, uh, Jan Hogan, who was a great physicist um, who had an interest in all kinds of branches, all branches of theoretical physics, and uh, so he died last week, 21 years ago, here in Trieste, uh, suddenly, and uh, left a void in my life. So it was thanks to him that uh, I personally got uh, really contaminated with this uh, desire to understand things and to express them in terms of some mathematical formulas. And uh, so I would like to dedicate this to him. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very inspiring and interesting talk. And I want to say personally that I completely share uh, what Nikita said about Jan. Each time when I'm in uh, uh, Grignano, uh, nearby the, the hotel uh, Adriatica, I remember a very good friend, Jan, who visited us. Also, we shared it ideas. It's a it was a really a very good friend and great physicist. Uh, please, questions and comments. <laughs> yes. So you had this special um, set C curve. Uh, <clears throat> In your uh, because of the lattice, if the, if you have a higher genus curve, would you get a Picard curve? Would I get sorry what? A Picard curve, one which is sort of given by a triple or, uh, covering of the plane. So if you uh, have a uh, high gen I mean, if you have a curve with additional symmetry, that uh, that is very useful for the analysis of these flows. So you can have special flows which will uh, uh, require fewer parameters to tune. I don't know if you can make a material which will realize that, uh, which will actually realize it, but why not? I mean, maybe. See. maybe, you see, if you take a multi-layer, again, thinking in terms of Hitchin systems, if you take a multi-layered graphene, who knows, maybe there is a spectral curve hiding there of higher genus. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, Greg. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's, that's related to a question I was trying to understand. So you, you, you took sigma to be an elliptic curve and then it wasn't when you discussed the general Young Mills flows, and because it makes sense then. But isn't is sigma a torus because that's the Brillouin torus? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So then the then the higher genus is just a mathematical extension, or are you jet or yeah, you're you see, spec well, uh, maybe. I mean, sometimes Fermi surfaces can have yeah, higher genus, yeah. but um, but you know, if you're just doing, you know. Band theory, no, we need, it's going to be a yeah, torus. Right, but okay. we need some kind of, uh, so here it was interesting that you can actually realize a non-abelian non gauge field in, in, in laboratory. So uh, maybe uh, one can, can I mean, who knows? I mean, it could be that there is an effective Fermi surface which takes into account this non-abelian structure, and then it could be of high genus. Other questions, comments, please? People are tired. Let's thank the organizers for making it bring up. It's a pleasure to thank them. Titanic work, really. Thank, thank you very work. much.